Welcome to the morning stream, where we are going to watch YouTube videos until I finish my coffee, and then at one point, I'm going to start playing Star Wars, I think. But I kind of want to watch this video first. Um, so let's This episode of Real Engineering is brought to you by the Curiosity Stream and Nebula Bundle Deal. This, now just 11.59 This for uh, an entire video, by the way, is called... The Insane Engineering of James Webb Telescope. A year until December and I'm sure 24th. this video will tell you all about it. I don't think it is very useful to speculate on what God might or might not be able to do. Rather, we should examine what he actually does with the universe we live in. All our observations suggest that it operates according to well-defined laws. These laws may have been ordained by God, but it seems that he does not intervene in the universe to break the laws, at least, not once he had set the universe going. In the cauldron of the early We're universe, in a We're in a no sim. light could escape the dense, opaque fog of primordial gas. As this cosmic soup of atomic particles began to cool down, Hydrogen atoms began to form, or like a speck leading of a peck, to the universe's speck of a speck first on the screen. bright, like Earth is a tiny dot on the screen right now. burning through the fog that once blocked all light from escaping the expanding universe. Some of these early photons have traveled unhindered through the vast, empty expanse of space for 13.5 billion years, and will reach their final destination here on the man-made detectors of the James Webb Telescope. A space odyssey coming to an end because of the curiosity of humans. The James Webb Telescope is going to give us our first detailed glimpse of this early universe from which we and everything we know early morning was born. Science stream. The James Webb Telescope is a $10 billion endeavor, just, uh, an endeavor that has eaten into Webb. NASA's limited budget, consuming one quarter of NASA's entire astronomy budget for years. Uh, and this in the launch, early hours of the launch, launch, launch date of December 24th, this $10 billion gamble will launch aboard Eve. the Ariane 5 rocket, oh a European heavy-lift launch vehicle from the European spaceport in Kourou, French Guyana. I'm Astronomers, try to watch that physicists, live. Would and enthusiasts that live. alike will look on with nervous excitement as this rocket carries the next generation in human curiosity. This is the insane. The telescope honestly looks so James cool. James Webb Space Telescope. Will it launch? I, okay, honestly, my thought is that it manages to launch, but the maybe it doesn't get required to unfolded make the correctly Webb in space, possible, and then we're stuck to this with time space trash. In human history. The launch vehicle, the image processing, the electromechanical systems, the cooling systems, the mirror, and the sun shield. Dang. This endeavor is the culmination. Of not just decades of work from the engineers and scientists at NASA, but thousands of years of work of our ancestors. Hmm. The materials and engineering required to peer back 13.5 billion years into the reionization epoch are a punctuation point in human history what that we, the human race, should be celebrating and watching with bated breath together. The launch will take place here in French Guiana, a spaceport ideally located on the Earth's equator oh. to give the James Webb Telescope an extra push towards its final destination. <gasps> the James Webb Telescope so far. will not be in orbit around Dude, the Dude, Hubble's that like close. Hubble. It will be launching to a destination 1.5 million kilometers Wait, from Earth. Wait, L2 is that far? Point two. L2 is that far? Points are special points in space where small objects like satellites can stay more or less in the same position relative to the gravitational bodies that they are traveling with. Wait. This happens because the gravitational pull from the two bodies precisely equals the centripetal force required for Wait, the L2's object way to further move than with I thought it was. the gravitational bodies. That's actually Like insane. little parking spots in space that allow satellites to sit in a relatively stable position while using a minimal amount of fuel to stay there. There are five Lagrange points between the Sun and Earth. L1 lies between the Sun and Earth. It's extremely useful for Sun observation satellites. However, the nature of the James Webb Telescope's job wants it to avoid the light from the Sun 
as much as possible, because it is an infrared telescope. Infrared is heat, and the heat emanating from the sun would completely saturate its sensors and make observing the cold, distant past impossible. So it will be launching to L2, located about here. That's pretty far. Here the telescope can turn its back to the sun, earth, and moon, which will stay in the same position, nicely lined up behind the telescope, thanks to Lagrange Point 2's unique physics. In order to operate correctly, the dark side of the telescope needs to operate so... at minus 233 degrees Celsius. Wait, Without what? a way to block out the heat from the sun and earth, the telescope would be scorched at 83 degrees Celsius, nearly hot enough to boil water. This is a huge amount of heat to block, and to do this, the James Webb Telescope will carry a massive shield on its back like a tortoise. I need a person and standing next to that. And making such, oh. such a device is a very, very tough problem. That's Mike Mansell, mission systems engineer for the James Webb Telescope. We had to map sure every close. heat flow yeah. to make sure that we do not let any heat leak through <laughs> from the hot side to the cold side to make sure that that sunlight, which is dumping approximately 200,000 watts of power onto, onto the, onto the, uh, in our direction, we only want less than about a watt of that to make it through. From 200,000 to, 200, to so less than one watt? Cools down to those temperatures. Preventing that heat transfer is, as Mike said, a very tough job. Heat can transfer in three ways. Conduction, where heat is transferred from uh -huh. atom to atom in direct contact with each other, like heat traveling down a copper pipe. Convection, where heat is transferred from the physical movement of atoms. And radiation, Convection where heat oven. is transferred by electromagnetic Radiator, waves. like a heater? In the okay. vacuum of space, convection isn't a concern. So that leaves conduction okay. and radiation yeah, as methods space. of heat transfer. Let's see Conduction how the James Webb radiation. Telescope is managing these. First, material choice. That's like aluminum the foil. The sun shield needs to be light, strong, There's resistant no way to degradation. I mean, it's foil, sure, but not Dimensionally stable across a range of temperatures and reflective. That's a long shopping list of requirements and Captain, a type of high performance plastic, Captain? manages to check all the boxes. K -A -P -P Each layer of Captain's Captain. sun shield is incredibly thin. Layer 1, the layer closest to the sun, is the thickest at 0.05 millimeters. At While thickest is 0.05 millimeters? to 5 millimeters thick. Captain by itself is actually transparent, which isn't a fantastic trait for a sun blocking heat shield. Yeah, what? Thankfully, the wonder material that is Captain can be easily coated in other mm. materials. Each layer is coated in a 100 oh, is aluminum. thick coating of aluminium. Aluminium. The sun shield its reflective appearance. This reflective quality helps prevent heat transfer through radiation by simply bouncing that radiation back to space. And with the gaps between each layer, the heat that is absorbed can't easily transfer through conduction or convection. Oh, because there's the advantage gaps. of the highly insulating vacuum of space well, between each it's layer. It's actually aluminum foil. Heat could still transfer That's actually between insane. each layer through radiation. The outermost layer will gain heat and start glowing with infrared radiation, just as we see through an infrared camera. In order to prevent this, huh? the sun shield has some clever engineering designs. The layers are angled relative to each other to ensure the reflected radiation between each layer is funneled out Science. of space. Science! Wait. Wait, how would they even begin to learn this? How would they even begin to know this? That you, at certain angles, During you can each layer get the... gradually reduces the temperature what? as it gets closer to the critical components in the instrument bay. The layers gradually get smaller in area from layer 1 through 5, ensuring the mirror only has a direct line of sight with the coldest layer at all times. Layer 1 itself is also coated in a special silicon coating 50 nanometers. 50 nanometers thick? 50 nanometers? Is that not the same as 0.05 millimeters? Thick, giving it this pink appearance. 
silicon was used because it has high emissivity. Oh, Simply look at it. Meaning, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see it's kind of pink right here. How do they coat the foil, I wonder? Like, a lot of that resources must have been spent, like, in manufacturing. It emits a lot of energy. It absorbs out as thermal radiation, meaning the material will not hold onto its heat, which would give it time to conduct through the structure of the spacecraft to areas we want to cool. Dude. This high emissivity silicon coating is applied to layer one and two, the two oh, hottest layers, two layers. Nice. helping them send their heat back out to space, away from the spacecraft as fast as possible. These design choices are what allow the heat shield to maintain the massive heat differential between the hot and cold side. But blocking heat is just one challenge. Theoretically, if this was held out in like, like, okay, we're at 950. Like, where was that? Where's that L1, L2 showcase? Right here? Like, right here, right? So we're going all the way out here for it, and it's facing into the this direction. But let's say we put it right here, like, not too far from Earth. Like, let's say we put it where, uh, where that other, where uh, Hubble is, right? Like, let's say we put it right here, except on the sun side, and we put the shield up, like, right here. Oh, wait, you can't even see. Okay, so we put, like, the, the satellite right here and the sun shield, like, right here, right? If you put the sun shield right here, I feel like if it's, if it's so good at blocking heat, would, like, they're not start ice forming? Isn't, like, the sun kind of just, like, creates everything, like, for us? So if, if we had the sun shield right here, I mean, I know it's, like, tiny and it would, like, make a small spot on Earth. But it would like, you know how when there's a, um, uh, when the sun and the moon, an eclipse, when an eclipse happens, it gets cold really fast. I feel like the same shit would happen. Hot and cold side, but blocking heat is just one challenge. Th that, that's one of the bigger challenges. Along Let there with be light. Just designing a deployment system that does this complicated, you know, unnecessary unfolding, oh, no. Not unfolding reliably and correctly. In order to fit inside the fairing of the Ariane 5 rocket, the sun shield has to be folded and stowed before- What the fuck? What the fuck? This is how it's gonna start? Oh no, it's ruined. Ariane 5 rocket. The sun shield has to be folded oh, no. and stowed before launch. Oh, leading no. to some incredibly complicated mechanics oh, no. oh, to ensure no. it unfolds correctly <laughs> what when in the game time fuck? arrives. Damn, that's what they're transporting it in? Oh, that's on some CIA Deploying shit. Deploying things in space and all is always difficult. Sure, but sure. when you're deploying rigid structure, uh, that's generally what us engineers would call deterministic. That's right. relatively easy. Membranes and cables are almost inherently non-deterministic. And if you want to, you know, have describe or illustrate what that means, try uh, pushing on a string. You know, the string will move, but if I ask you to determine the shape that it will assume, you will have a very, very hard time doing that. So to control these almost non-deterministic... That's a great visualization. That was a great visualization. Holy shit. Describe you cannot get, like, the same shape try twice. pushing on a string. You know, the string will Wait, move. Wait, what? But if I ask you to determine... I wonder... Those are like minor differences, I think, in friction and pressure. And maybe the strength of the push, maybe. But like if all... If it was a simulation, right? And the, all the variables were the same, technically it would show the same. Of course, in reality, that would not be possible, but... Huh. Is, uh, it takes a great deal of effort, a great deal of trial and error. And even after we're done getting it, you know, getting the design right. At least they're pulling. The one thing they're smart about for that, a, the right? sun shield, it's, just, it's almost like a parachute, or it's very similar to a parachute. Uh, you know the parachute will work, but it's also only as good as the very, very last time you fold it. And you're going to find out whether you folded it correctly or not when you uh, use it. 
Little James Webb the tell us how better fucking work out, man. A few days after launch, not oh, too far no. from Earth. Oh. Starting with relatively simple mechanisms, with okay. the solar panels and communications antenna deploying. The truly nerve-wracking process begins on, on day seven. As A the week after launch. As the spacecraft coasting towards L2, there are over 300 single points of failure. Wait, it doesn't wait until it gets there? Wait, it starts deployment while on its way to L2. Solar arrays deploy. Separation from the launcher. Followed by trajectory maneuver 1A. The deployment of communication antennas and trajectory maneuver 1B. The truly nerve-wracking process begins on day 7. As the spacecraft deployment is of two structures protecting the folded sun shield, lateral deployment of the sun shield, and tensioning and separation of the five sun shield. Damn, only a week in to the launch? That's actually way earlier than th I thought. I thought it would be at L2. least like two weeks, man. There are over 300 single points of failure in this unfold. That is the worst sentence possible. Sequence. 300 chances for a $10 billion, 25-year project narrator, to end. Man. 107 pins holding the sun shield together have to be released on cue to allow the system of pulleys, <sighs> motors, cables, <gasps> bearings, and springs to begin on furling the sun shield into its precise, complete shape. I mean, they this wouldn't launch if they weren't confident, right? take three days, right? Right? and right? once complete, the optical components will unfold and lock into place. Okay. So, after unfolding, secondary mirror, mirror unfolding of the secondary mirror and support structure. Oh, this is the secondary mirror right here. There's a little two ledges. And then primary mirror. Oh, shit. This is the primary mirror. This little, uh, this little point thing right here. See that? This little t piece on top unfolds. Completing the transformation process. Ooh. But we are most certainly not in the clear. Oh, but we still... Damn, so the it still likelihood has to travel the tennis court sized sunshield being struck by micro meteorites is fairly high. What? What? Micro meteorites? What do you mean? And because this is a thin layer of plastic stretched out under tension, a small tear ruined by an impact could cause a runaway tear ripping through. Yeah, well, you get one tiny rip, it's over. There's no sunshield. there's no way. To prevent one tiny this, rip, ruined rip it stop all. seams have been molded. Into oh, wait. the sun shield, Never mind. which will arrest tears and keep them confined to a single portion of the shield okay. without compromising structural integrity. All right. The film has also been carefully molded with corrugations and other shapes to stiffen and shape the shield as needed. Oh, this passive cooling system helps tremendously, ensuring the dark side of the telescope is shielded from the sun's heat, keeping its sensitive heat detecting instruments at 40 degrees Kelvin. About minus 233 degrees Celsius. Approaching zero K, but huh? Parts Absolute of zero. the telescope, specifically the mid infrared detection instrument located here, needs to be even colder to work correctly. It needs to be seven degrees Kelvin. Just seven degrees off the absolute minimum temperature of the universe what? of zero degrees Kelvin. Bro, how do you even get this, it that cold? We need active cooling. The James Webb Telescope oh, includes cooling, of an innovative cryocooler for this purpose. The challenge in developing this cryocooler alone was immense, costing $150 million. Getting cold temperatures is just one small part of the design. Vibration has to be eliminated, as the tiniest movement of the telescope could cause massive blurs in the image as it attempts to focus on objects billions of light years Look away. Look at that. That means eliminating I'm ready for moving infrared parts images. where possible. And when that can't be done, incredibly precise machining and movement is needed. Honestly, wait, this would be cool wall art. Like that means eliminating not this. moving parts where possible. Okay, pull it up. And pull when it up. that can't this? be done, this is pretty cool. Just like as its own thing. Like look at that. Oh, machining but look at this. Ah, oh, look at the machining like he said. Damn, what is the mirror made out of? Why is it yellow? How, how come we have not talked Movement about that? Movement is needed to balance weights Ooh, as they that looks move. so pretty though. The cooler also needs to use a tiny amount of electricity, as the telescope only has 2,000 watts of power 
provided by its solar array, and it needs to run reliably for years. That means for a closed-loop cycle Decades, with our refrigerant being continually reused. I found this explanation of the cryo cooler on NASA's site. This pump and cools helium gas, changes heat, high efficiency pump. The pre cooler features a two cylinder, horizontally opposed pump and cools helium gas using pulse tubes, which exchange heat with the regenerator acoustically. Okay, horizontally opposed pumps with carefully balanced pistons. What that the would hell? Okay, pressure wave generator, sure. Pressure, PV, or maybe, I don't know. Rare generator heat pump, cold, or HX is fluid, and then, or uh, helium, cold helium, form helium, science. Vibration as the weights balance each other out. But the rest of that explanation sounds like it came straight out of a sci fi novel. A sound wave is just a pressure wave. Pressure and temperature are directly proportional. Higher pressure will cause higher temperature. Correct. One way I learned we income, can take guys. advantage of this is by creating a standing wave where the peaks and troughs of the wave are stationary. We can do this in a closed tube where the resonant frequency of the tube is determined by the tube's length. Here, the sound wave will bounce off the closed end and create a region of compression and high pressure, and therefore high temperature. This alone isn't terribly useful. The energy and oh, temperature what? in this system will stay relatively stable, left on its own. But what if we could extract some of this heat with each cycle? Then, on each cycle, we could gradually cool the overall system. To do this, we need a way to pass energy out of the system. This is done with a stack, a porous material with air gaps that allow sound to pass through it which is placed so that it smoothly spans both the hot region at the end of the tube and the cold region in the center like this. Okay. A heat exchanger is then placed on either end of the stack. This one is getting interesting. Side and one for the cold. Okay. The hot heat exchange will conduct its heat to the center of the sun shield where it can radiate out to space while the cold portion will conduct its heat or lack thereof to a copper plate attached to the back of the infrared sensors to cool them to 6.2 degrees Kelvin. This is obviously an extreme oversimplification wait, 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 wait. of. Wait, 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 wait. So they're what? The actual That's operation of around. the pulse tube cryo cooler. They're using sound. This is just cool a it? basic explanation of the physical phenomenon that allows it to work. The pulse tube cryo cooler is quite possibly the most fascinating mm. part of this spacecraft to yeah, me. What the utilizing fuck? a simple physical Goddard? phenomenon and part Who's of Goddard? the spacecraft. Goddard Space Flight to Center? To me, utilizing a simple physical phenomenon Goddard. with extreme NASA. precision. Allowing Goddard those infrared in sensors NASA. located Named for Pioneer in Dr. Robert the H. Goddard. beautiful golden mirror to work. The golden mirrors are the most striking part of the telescope. Made. Okay, wait. Robert H. Goddard. Look at this real quick. Father of modern rocket propulsion. Liquid fueled rocket. That's actually insane. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna take a leak real fast. Hold on, hold on, hold on.
Okie okay, dokie. Okay. Let's keep going. So, what's the deal with the design? Six pointing part of the telescope made of 18 hexagonal segments, 6.5 meters in diameter. NASA's, NASA so, would, if they were smart, they would sell little, little mirrors that look like hexagons that are kind of yellow like that. Maybe not even little mirrors, big ass mirrors. What's the deal with the design? Like it's unlike mirrors. any telescope mirror I have ever seen. The mirror surface itself is beryllium plated in gold. That's a unique and... Wait, 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 wait. Beryllium. Beryllium plated in gold. Itself is beryllium, pla beryllium. plated in gold. Oh, okay. I'm sure he'll go over That's it. a unique and why expensive beryllium? material choice. Maybe also why gold. We need but... the structure of these mirrors to remain in an extremely precise shape to reflect light as desired. They can't bend and they can't warp with temperature changes and they mm. also need to be extremely lightweight to reduce launch costs. Beryllium is a lightweight metal with an atomic weight of just four, it's much lighter than silica glass, a more traditional mirror subsurface material. While being far more capable in dealing with the cryogenic temperatures the mirror will operate in, keeping its shape and not contracting- Look at all those, look at all these, uh, wow, look at all these, what the fuck? It's like a zoo. You see all the people? The low key, that would be me though. If I was there, I'd be having the camera and out. And not contracting so much that it ruins the carefully shaped Yay. curves of the mirror. While nowhere near as strong as steel, beryllium is much stiffer with a Young's modulus of 300 gigapascals. This means that while beryllium is easier to break than steel, it's harder to deform before it actually breaks, giving it excellent dimensional stability. On a pound for pound basis, beryllium is six times stiffer mm, than steel, good to know. making it the perfect subsurface material for this mirror. However, whoa, even like, so since, you know, they have to like minimize the weight and shit. Steel. I mean, like, no shit, this makes sense. Making it the perfect subsurface material for the. Dang, structural rigidity. So this is all beryllium then, huh? This That's mirror. actually crazy. However, it is not reflective. For that, we need to turn Why to gold. Why do we choose gold? Gold is not the best reflector of visible light being particularly poor at reflecting the lower frequencies of the visible spectrum, giving it its distinctive golden hue. Uh -huh. But critically, it is an excellent reflector of the infrared spectrum, while being very unreactive, mm. ensuring the mirror surface will not tarnish and lose its shine during its operation. To reflect that light, a very thin coat, just 0.1 micron in thickness, Zero is coated over the micron. polished beryllium subsurface taking just 48.2 grams of gold about the same weight as a golf ball 48.2 grams of gold all right guys 42 grams of gold in usd 48 grams of gold that's it wait that's actually not bad 3k that's nothing I mean, we're talking about the U.S. government. That's like literally nothing. That's like literally a penny. Thirty-three dollars a gram of fourteen carat. I'm sure it doesn't matter what kind of carat. I, I mean, I'm sure it matters for the for NASA when they're making this, but I'm sure the price differences aren't huge. Damn, that's actually really impressive how little that takes. A surprisingly small amount for the huge mirror which has a collecting area about 25 meters squared. Is that Hubble? That is Hubble. Whoa, it's five, five, five. It's massive. Wait, Hubble's also ugly as fuck. TBH. Granted, what year did Hubble launch? But like as a telescope, that makes sense because it's also a regular like visual light telescope compared to infrared. But five times larger than Hubble's 4.5 meter squared circular glass mirror. The mirror needs to be massive, and to explain why, I asked Mike Mansell. Well, I could tell you how much it's collecting. Uh, first, uh, we're looking for uh, uh, stars or, or stellar objects or things that are approximately going to be a nanojansky. What the fuck and to is explain a what a nanojansky okay. is? Units of bright, a unit of brightness. It's very, very dim. We're looking for the among the dimmest things there are in the sky. 
if I was to put a child's nightlight, puts out about five watts, put it on the surface of the moon and look at it from the Earth, that source would appear to be 20 nanojanskis. So we're looking for objects that are 1 20th as bright as that. What the fuck? To do that, you need a Wait. big telescope. Picture light uh -huh. as, as rain coming in. If you want to collect a lot of rain, you make a big, wide bucket. <laughs> Well, even at the, at the size of our bucket, six meters across, we're only collecting about one photon per second, one particle of light per second. And to put that in perspective, I'll go out tonight or any night and look at the brightest star there is in the sky. Your eye is probably collecting about one million photons per second from that star. Okay. So to see these very dim things, the dimmest things there are to see in the universe, you need a light bucket that's at least the six meters in diameter. Wait, wait, why? Wait, One wait, wait. photon. F light. Um, do I have a f hard misunderstanding of how light works? Isn't light constantly? I guess light's not everywhere. Light is definitely not everywhere. But doesn't light travel in all directions like very fast? Like, why would it be one photon per second? Like, if something was, like, all right, if I'm looking at a star, and I'm getting a million photons per second, and this telescope's looking at a star, why would it get one photon per second? When this light is traveling regardless, no? Photon per second really puts things into perspective. Mike and the rest of the team working on the James Webb telescope actually wanted the mirror to be bigger. But the cost of launching a mirror <laughs> that size between hey. increased weight and limited space <laughs> James Webb telescope was bigger it wouldn't launch the 2030 man was not cost effective no way they maximized the size with the resources available and incredibly even though the mirror's collecting surface is 5.5 times larger than hubble's the james webb mirror is 62 percent lighter than hubble's massive solid glass mirror that is an astounding weight saving yeah they're crazy driven for by that, launch weight requirements to get the telescope to l2 and the mirror is even programmable. Oh, it's folding right there when Holy hubble shit. first began transmitting images back to earth it became clear that there was something wrong with the telescope's optics instead of the crisp awe-inspiring images we are all familiar with today the early images came back blurred the mirror had been ground down too flat by a mere 2,000 nanometers, 1 50th the thickness of a human hair. But that was enough to cause the light to be focused incorrectly. What? 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 I didn't know about that. Why would that not? How would that? Oh my god. The, the, just knowing that makes me almost 100% sure the James Webb telescope fails. What the fuck? The light to be focused incorrectly on the telescope sensors. Replacing the mirror was not an option, but Hubble was designed to be serviced throughout its lifetime, featuring modular equipment bays that allowed older equipment to be removed and replaced. In order to correct the issue, I would love corrective the space optics were installed into one of these equipment bays, like a giant pair of glasses for the $1.5 billion telescope. James Webb will not be serviceable. <clears throat> it's simply too far away from Earth beyond the range of any space vehicles capable of carrying humans to oh, service no, it. Oh, no. If there was a problem with the mirrors, that would be game over. Oh, but no. the engineers oh, no. were not taking chances this time and have engineered a system capable of adjusting its focus by itself. What? Each of the 18 separate mirrors can contort its shape and adjust mm. its position relative to the secondary mirror located in the main mirror's focal point. The weight saving isogrid rear side of the beryllium mirrors. Oh, we were just talking about this weight saving isogrid. Are assembled with a system of backplates, struts, and motors that can not only adjust the mirror's rotation, Dang. but with the center motor and these struts, the mirrors can actually change their curvature to adjust the focal point of the mirrors. A feature that could. Hey, man, someone should have wiped this down. Look have corrected at the dirty ass issues fingers. from Earth. Once fully deployed, I wonder how the long telescope it would take, though. will begin its calibration phase, with each mirror adjusting itself until each of the 18 segments have aligned correctly with the secondary mirror. 
a 0.74 meter convex mirror, which itself has six motors to adjust its position. These motors and control systems Sheesh. are so precise that the mirrors can adjust their positions in steps on the scale of wavelengths of light. <gasps> Creeping closer Fire. to alignment. Dude, oh my god, this is so exciting. Ten thousandths the size of a human hair. That is an astoundingly accurate electromechanical system. Wait, that's insane. The engineers insane. of the James Webb Telescope performed this calibration test here on Earth sure. with an absolutely massive vacuum chamber that can be cooled down to the same we temperature have one of those. the telescope will operate at, ensuring proper focus can be achieved. But the job to get a clear image isn't done with primary and secondary mirror alignment alone. They focus the light onto the Cassegrain focus, which is located inside the aft mm. optics subsystem. This black protrusion in the middle of the primary mirror, which blocks stray light from entering the aperture. In the darkness within, there are two more mirrors. What? One of them being the fine steering mirror. And this thing is the world's most expensive image stabilization tool. <laughs> it is controlled by the fine guiding system. The fine guiding system is locked onto a guide star, and its job is to keep that star in the center of its field of view. Every 64 milliseconds, the fine guiding system will send signals to the attitude control system to make adjustments to ensure the telescope stays mm, on target. Okay, okay. This attitude control is done with a combination of six reaction wheels located inside the spacecraft bus below the heat shield. And oh no. with the fine steering oh no. mirror. Okay. This mirror will constantly be adjusting itself to ensure the target of the telescope stays steady on the sensors, minimizing blur. The I telescope also has thrusters for larger position maintenance. 191 litres of hydrazine and 95.5 litres of its oxidizer, oh. dinitrogen tetraoxide, will be stored inside the spacecraft bus oh that God. will feed. 20 different rocket thrusters scattered around is the that telescope. enough there are eight thruster modules two on each corner of the spacecraft bus to aid the reaction wheels in spinning the telescope to point to well i guess in a vacuum or in space you these just 16 need a tiny, engines will be fed tiny, with hydrazine tiny only a monopropellant reaction where the hydrazine is passed over i can read this oh, yeah, i can read this okay hydrazine i assume this is hydrazine as a liquid into uh nitrogen dinitrogen uh, uh lowercase letters what do lowercase letters mean in fucking when the when the lower lace case letter comes first huh anyways dihydrogen and nh nitrogen and hydrogen nitro ni nitro hydrogen NH3 is it C wait NH3 isn't that ammonia or something using a highly exothermic reaction breaking the hydrazine down color added nitrogen, for effect hydrogen and ammonia all right fair enough the other four motors are for orbital and positional control and require more power they will be fed by both hydrazine and dinitrogen tetraoxide this fuel and oxidizer mixture nitrogen oxide dihydrazine turns into three nitrogen and four uh, H2O molecules. React hypergolically to form nitrogen and water. Hypergolic meaning they do not need an igniter. They simply ignite on contact with each other. Hydrazine is an excellent choice for a long lasting mission like this. Why? The hypergolic reaction means the motors can repeatedly and reliably fire without a point of failure causing issues like an igniter breaking. Hydrazine mm, is also stable for long periods at room temperature, allowing room it to be stored over the expected 10 year life cycle of the James Webb telescope. 25 years! 25 years for a 10 year life cycle? What do you mean, 10 year life cycle? Unfortunately, that life cycle is limited to 10 years precisely because of the fuel. Oh my Between god. pointing and orbital oh maintenance, we will run out of fuel. Oh at some my point. god. And NASA currently has no way of refueling the telescope. But rumors are, behind the scenes, NASA is looking to develop the technologies required to sure refuel the I'm James Webb sure telescope. Are. 
before its demise 10 years from now. Robots capable of refueling spacecraft far from Earth is an exciting concept. Yeah, the James Webb happening. Telescope could end up teaching us many more fascinating things beyond the early stages of the universe. It's my hope is... <laughs> Look, they're pushing it by hand 500 million dollars or whatever this Canadian is they're pushing it by hand except the james what webb the telescope fuck? They don't, look at them bro what the fuck they don't have like a motor in here to i mean obviously there's got to be some sort of motor pushing this there's no way they these guys are moving it but man look at them teaching us many more fascinating <laughs> things beyond the early <laughs> that guy was like slow down look <laughs> he's like hey slow down many more slow fascinating down slow things. down <laughs> beyond the early stages of the universe it's my hope as an engineer and after being 25 years on this job that eventually our telescopes the really 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 big ones of the future will be built in space um, testing James Webb a telescope that's designed to work in space has been a very difficult thing to do on the ground 25 years and i'm hoping that someday we'll be building these things in space testing them in space tweaking them in space and then deploying them in space that way we are on the frontier of a new space age and the james webb telescope is a milestone on our journey towards being a more capable spacefaring society this is just one of many milestones in our brief time as a species capable of escaping our planet's gravity from building our incredible global positioning network and sending satellites to the far reaches of our solar system, to visiting the moon and building reusable rockets. It's never been more exciting to be an aerospace enthusiast, especially when you can get access to the Curiosity Stream and Nebula Bundle deal for just $11.59 a year. This holiday deal gets you access to incredible mm. space documentaries on Curiosity Stream for less than a dollar a month. And with that yearly subscription, you will get full access to our Nazis. Battle of Britain series launching in the new year and our nine part Logistics of D-Day series that is ready for you to watch right now. This discount will end on the 24th All of right, December. That was pretty cool. So you have less than a week to avail of this deal. I a great like stocking to, uh, filler gift for the documentary videos, fan in your life while supporting this channel in the most effective way possible. Nebula gives us a place to experiment in safety without any worry Options. of alienating our current audience on YouTube or being demonetized for covering sensitive topics like war. Your support there has helped this channel evolve and grow, and we are able to give you exclusive James content Webb like this Telescope. as our thanks. Many of you will be happy to hear that we finally released a Roku app for Nebula, giving you more options on how to enjoy our ad-free videos. The best way to support this channel is by signing up to Nebula through the Nebula and Curiosity Bundle deal for just $11.59 a year. With access to both mm. Nebula and all the amazing award-winning yeah, documentaries on Curiosity Stream, like this like, amazing series called Trajectory that tracks the scientific time? milestones of space science over time. You can sign up to this amazing deal by clicking oh. on this button on screen right now or if you're looking for something right. else to watch right now, you could watch our last video on the future of super- The insane biology of the orca. That's, that's kind of tempting actually. Insane biology of the orca? Okay. Okay. This video Why is not? brought to you by Curiosity Stream. I gotta fix Sign up today here. at curiositystream.com slash real science to get both Curiosity Stream and Nebula for just eleven fifty nine for the entire year.